So very close to the top. There we are. Phew. Four days later, not Alex Honnold. And there's Alan. And um, he couldn't get up once he lay down. He was there for a, a long time. And eventually I said, look, we've got to sleep somewhere. So we, he got up and he crawled somewhere and we, we slept for the night. Um, and finally, uh, last little thing, is this beautiful 10 mile walk down through the woods from the top. You, you can do a shortcut kind of over the edge of El Capitan near the, where the rockfall happened the other day. And you can go down that section. But we, were a, we wanted a, a, a leisurely walk, so we walked down. But we did get lost. And so this is Alan's last picture. Um, to try to work out where the hell are we and all the bears and monsters in the forest are ready to gobble us up. I think that's it really. Um, just to say, uh, so, so that's, that's us. And um, feel free to ask me any questions at all. Uh, maybe now's the best moment for that. Any questions? Does there many people go up? I like to have to book. To ah, yeah. Already? Um, you don't book, you just launch up there and when people come up beside you or you just get in a huge tangle and you don't know what you're doing and then get confused. Um, we didn't actually have a problem because we seemed to avoid anyone else. Um, our third, no, our second campsite, that little tiny ledge, we got there just about 10 minutes before three other guys came up part. <laughs> to that ledge. So we sort of got the accommodation. They had to carry on through the night and I think they climbed until two in the morning to get to the next ledge, which is a few pitches further up. So there's not a lot of space for extra people. Um, people do have epics. There are, people have had obviously accidents and there's been serious accidents occasionally. Um, quite a lot of, I think 70% of people who try it for the first time retreat off it before because they get freaked out and you know get whatever so um yeah but it is very much ad hoc you just give it a shot all right now any other questions before i yeah is, is the rope bolted or do you place your own gear okay yeah so the anchor points are bolted but there's no there's no gear in between so the cracks and stuff you just have to put your own gear in there are a couple of places where there's a bolt ladder because it's a completely blank rock with nowhere possible to go in any direction and then there's some bolts in place but pretty much you're doing it with your own gear. What grade is it on it? Um, if you don't free climb it, it's 5.9 which is America, so what would that be, I don't know, grade 18, 19 in New Zealand? Um, if you want to free climb it, it gets ridiculously hard. Um, first free climbed by a woman in 1996, Lynn Hill, and she, nobody repeated it for something like 10 years. But now, people, have, several people have done it before, since then. Um, lastly, your kind donation of $5 is going to help out these guys. So I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Lion. It's a really moving movie about the, it's a story of a little Indian boy who gets lost in a railway station in India, and he's only five. And he goes through this horrendously traumatic childhood, getting lost, getting grabbed by people, ending up in an orphanage, and finally getting adopted into some, a family in Australia. So he's a kind of lucky one. But there's a charity. I saw this movie, and I got really sort of moved by the story. It's a very moving story. It's called um, Lion, and that's the, that's the poster for it. Um, so anyway. The, if you go onto the website for this movie, there is charities that you can donate to to help these little kids. And so one of the charities is called the Railway Children, and it's, they're setting up little safe havens in some of these big Indian railway stations. So kids who are lost, and there's many of them, they can have some food and some advice and some adult care so that they're not vulnerable to just whatever horrendous stuff could happen. So I thought it was a really beautiful charity to support. And so your five dollars is going to help these kids, if that's okay with you. And uh, you're welcome to add another five dollars if you feel like it, because it's a worthy cause. So that's that. Okay. One final question. Yep. Do you have any real big lows, like you thought? They said earlier that once you did that first, um, first bed, you knew technically you could do it, but now of you know, sheer will and determination. But after you had gone past that first bed, at any point in the next three days or so, did you? No, I think not really, not psychologically. We just knew we were going to do it and we just kept going. 
and every we kind of just break it down into steps. You kind of think, okay, what's the next thing to do? And don't worry about the one after that. And so it's kind of a feeling of ticking off a, a load of little things one at a time. There were times when I was absolutely at my limit of frustration because I was kind of about to fall off and I, I couldn't hear Alan around the corner and, and sometimes the same with him. So if the guy's around the corner climbing something delicate and he, you can't tell, does he want the rope tight or does he want it slack? And you make it tight and you're pulling him off. It's really freaky, because you, know, you can't tell what you're doing. So you're sort of listening to, and there's wind and this stuff. So there were a couple of moments like that which were pretty horrendous, but not in terms of feeling at all ever, this is too much. I don't know, you just sort of muddle through and then it seemed okay. What were you eating? Oh. We were advised by some local climbers just to buy lots of muesli bars and energy rich food and it was disgusting. And so we were sort of loading up on this stuff which I could hardly stomach after a while. Breakfast, you know, big biscuity, sweet, sugary things and stuff. But um, that was their advice so we thought, well these guys know this is what they eat. But they, they probably eat like that every day, I don't know. They just sort of, um, it, was, it was not what I would do again. Um, things like packets of chips crushed into a pulp so that you've just got salty, lots of salt and then you just put those in a little ziplock and just eat them like that. but very energy rich food but I think the main thing was I, f I was so exhausted even before starting the climb and by the time of spending three, several nights on my, I was almost falling asleep while I was holding the rope for my friend like while my eyes were going like this and I was like, no. No, it was, that was the hardest bit probably cool all right, thank you very much. Nice one, Jim. So you can give it. I can swap that, yeah. Thank you, and that's really cool, man. And um, I don't know what I'm in at hand of them saying I've got a few sets and I've got there. And I'll give my daughter and show them those guys. I think I'm going to draw a small amount of us. There you go. Oh, is it for the thing? Really oh, nice. oh, right. So that's one, um, oh, one that's really cool And I just thought, before introducing Jane, I just, just go to the don't know if I've explained okay. it properly, in the old, um, when it started, um, marathon, it was like the limits of a run. Then there was a thing called the 100k run, and if you run 100k, then you get to do the Yeah, sure. <laughs> He's in charge of technical stuff. I'll yell out when I see myself. <laughs> there I am. <laughs> I gave it a fright. High resolution for my PC maybe. So it's in Washington State, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a little map on the to show
Just <laughs> stand up. <laughs> wow, it's beautiful. How many people did it do? I think there's about 119. But the Tahoe 200 filled up for the first time this year, so they had to add another 50. So I think they had 250 in that one. So it's kind of getting more popular as it goes on. <laughs> Just your, um, I don't know, how, so, how do we yeah, work this? Yeah, I'll do it. So, slideshow <laughs> from the beginning. So, I can either do it or you can just press that. I've got a little, like, a little blurb. Oh, that's the information about the race. That's their cool oh, yep. logo. Bit of a research on yep. The woman that organised it, Candice, she seems really cool as well. Um, the first ever point to point 200 plus mile race in the United States. Original from the start. How, how long has it been going for? Right. I, this is the third one I did. Third, third ever. I think, yeah. Generation. So, evolution basically of ultra running. But if you want to just press that button there when you want the next okay. thing. Okay. So, I'll hand sure. it over to Jean. Welcome, Jean. Thanks all for right. talking. God, I've got notes, things, glasses. It's going to be a bit complicated. <laughs> I so which button? This this want. arrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one? That's where oh yeah, okay, great. I may not need those yeah. notes, but I'll... So why, you may ask? <laughs> well, I'd done um, 1,100 milers, and um, the last couple when I finished, I felt all right. <laughs> so I thought, well, I could probably do more than go further, and I'd heard about um, a couple of these 200 miles in the States. Um, I like to pick ones that are mountainous and really scenic, so um, I looked at the Tahoe 200, it didn't really rock my boat, then I saw this one straight away, I just thought, yep, that looks really good, and I think if you get that feeling when you see something, you might as well do it, no matter what other people say, you know, if your initial reaction is excitement, then you've got to go for it, so, so I entered. Um, it's supposed to be Spencer's boot. But you know, uh, that was just um, so part of the planning was a bit complicated. That was pretty daunting, I thought. Um, just started, just planning for a hundred miler um, or two hundred miler. Normally, what I do is I just read the course notes, and then I usually find some split times. That's what I've done for all of them. Um, I find out you generally when you train, you know how fast you're going to do something, and all the split times I've got have been pretty well, quite accurate. Um, then I just converted them all into local time so my husband came with me so that he would know what time I was going to be at certain places. Um, my nutrition I worked out, it's pretty basic. I usually just have like one scoop of perpetuum, sort of one scoop of something like tailwind per hour, maybe a gel every couple of hours. Plus I thought I'd just have food from the aid stations, so that was all that sorted. Um, then it's just a matter of um, the drop bags were complicated on 200 miles. It's hard enough for 100, but uh, they had moving drop bags. You had to kind of put things in them for like two or three different places. So everything was just put in little snap lock bags. Everything's labelled with times, distances, how many scoops, so that when I'm running, I don't have to think about anything because your brain's gone and you can't really. So you have to hope that you've planned it all out in advance. Um, my husband's uh, a pilot, well, he was a pilot in the Air Force, he's very technical, so he did a lot of planning uh, for the support crew. The roads there were really rough and narrow and not very well marked, so he had to do a lot of um, looking online at maps and stuff and driving times, and he worked all that out, I don't know how to do all that, but he did all that. Um, when we were thinking about it, I said we should just get a small RV, like uh, one of those ones without a toilet or a shower, but he didn't want to rough it. They said, oh, a 25 foot one's probably okay at the most, but when we got to Seattle, the, the RV was enormous. It was 25 foot, but it was a big, it was huge. But he had quite a few issues um, on the pothole roads, washouts, uh, lost his mirror. <laughs> He had quite a few issues, but every time he saw me at Ace, that he never once said anything. He was really good. So, but some of the roads you think here, the roads are crap here. You don't realise over there they're pretty. The roads are pretty bad. Pretty bad. Some of those places. Is that not? Is that going? Um, I suppose I should get on to the next image. Sorry, but this like so I should have gone on to that. But 
So this is what uh, we drew up as a vague idea. So I've got all my uh, times. Uh, the first row is for Tony, my husband, so where I would see him. Um, the number of the drop bag. <laughs> um, some of them are double because they move along. Just the ETA, that it, the time and the real local time that I thought I would be these places. Um, then the EET, uh, there was the aid station. The black is when I'm running in the dark. Um, elapsed times between them all, distance to next, total distance. And then whether it was mostly descent or mostly climb, put that in as well. Uh, I was pretty important that you have your head torch, so I knew when I got to these certain places that I'd have to pick up my torch. So I just carried that with me, it was like a laminated little thing. Um, the training I did was just pretty, pretty, pretty basic, just 10 to 15 hours a week, running up the hills around Wellington. That's pretty much it really. <laughs> I mean, what else can you do really? <laughs> It wasn't going to be that hot, so I didn't bother with like heat training and stuff like that. So it wasn't that high, about 7,000 feet was the highest, so I didn't need to do any altitude training or anything like that. Um, so the start, um, a pretty windy road to the start. Uh, we just stayed there in our RV, really only just made it in, in the RV and that was one of the better roads. So I just said, oh well, he'll sort it out, I can't worry about that sort of stuff. <laughs> Um, it was quite warm at the start, um, probably 25 degrees, really humid, and it got hotter as the day wore on. I knew the first day would be really hot, but I thought I'll be fresh, so it'll be okay, I'll be able to cope with it. Um, but when I started, and I know you shouldn't be thinking this really the first 20 minutes, but I thought, oh, this is really hot. Um, normally, if I'm going to win something, then I'll be the first woman, and I'm, oh, there's tons of people ahead of me, and oh, this is hopeless. It's quite funny how you think the stupid stuff right at the beginning. But um, I sort of got out of that and um, I was pretty, pretty surprised to cross like some couple of snow banks and stuff in the heat. I think that had quite a bad winter and it was uh, summer rather, so there was still snow from the winter before, which I was pretty amazed at considering the heat and stuff. Um, took me two and a half, or two hours 25 I think to the first aid station, I'd kind of estimated about two hours 30. And Tony said uh, then that I was first woman, I thought oh well, that's pretty good. <laughs> I figured there's 20 people ahead of me but there was only like three men or something. Um, the next one was this place called Windy Ridge, so we went over all the hot volcanic um, rock and stuff and I've forgotten my thing again so just tell me to move along if you want me to. Um, that was actually, going back, sorry, that was my husband's, all the stuff he had to give me and all written down, etc. Um, oh, picture of the start. So that was the uh, first leg that I just said, Blue Lake, that's Mount St Helens there. Um, that's the blast zone there, so we just ran right past that, which was really neat. Um, Getting to that, but um, on the first, second leg, first day, still you can see all the trees were just down. They'd all been just left there from when they were all knocked over, all just lying in the one direction. It was pretty cool. Um, that was really hot there, but I was running with this lady, Susie, and she said she was from Arizona, and I was pretty stoked to be keeping up with her. Um, survived that pretty well, actually, that bit. Um, there was a big, long gravel road up to the next aid station, which a lot of people hated, but I quite like, I just, you just put your music on and walk up it, and it's almost easier in a way, you can kind of zone out rather than on a technical track. Um, keep going, hang on a sec. Oh, I was coming around, finally got a good photo. <laughs> years and years of running, finally. <laughs> um, so that was called Johnston Ridge, so right in front of the volcano. Um, that would have been maybe three in the afternoon on the first day. I was pretty hot then actually. Our awesome aid station, you know when you get runners at an aid station, they know exactly and they gave me all these cold sponges and stuff and, and they were really good. And just before I got to that corner, a lady said the photographer's there, so I quickly put my number around the front and I was, you know, <laughs> picked myself up a bit. So. It's a bit of a fake one really I suppose, but yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Hang on, 
Oh, so this was so the next aid station was Coldwater um, Johnston was to Coldwater Lake. It was kind of late afternoon and actually I'd lost my managed to lose my spare headlamp. I didn't do it and pack properly fell out but uh, someone found it and uh, they took it to the aid, next aid station so I was quite relieved about that. That was just my spear but it was a really good one. Um, but it was a beautiful run down the hill in the late afternoon. There was little lakes, uh, wildflowers everywhere. Um, that first day the whole scenery was just really spectacular and it was really worth, worth going there. It was really neat. So I was having a great time actually, really enjoying myself. Um, Cold water lake, so I decided not, that's a sleep's first sleep station, but I decided to dispense with that. <laughs> so I just taped up my feet, and um, then the woman that was coming second just caught up as I was leaving the aid station. She spent about five minutes there, and I was there for about 20 minutes mucking around, really. Um, but as I started up the one of the highest peaks on the course, Mount Margaret, I just felt really good and happy and pretty much stormed up there. I was amazed again to see snow when it was so warm. Uh, the views were beautiful but I was trying to go quick so I could see them because it was getting dark. Um, it was just a wonderful night. I really love running in the night. I think that's why I like 100 milers. I really like going into, from day to night then waiting for the dawn and uh, there was no wind. It was a huge thunderstorm off in the distance. It was really spectacular. So that was a great night, I really enjoyed that. I was a bit worried about going up to the peak of Mount, you had these out and backs you had to go up to. I was a bit worried about like with my poles or something getting, you know, like electrocuted. <laughs> but it didn't happen, just as well, just as well. So that's just more uh, views from the, the first day. Um, well, I'm gonna keep going. Hang on, I'll just because I'll forget stuff. I don't tell you. So I ran pretty happily through the night. Um, met my husband at a place called Elk Pass. That was about 3:30 in the morning. I was quite tired there, so I thought, oh, I'm just starting to see a few things. <laughs> so I actually went into the camper van and had a sleep 20 minutes, and it was amazing the difference it made. Quite revived after that. I um, can't remember what I was going to say now. Not something exciting, but anyway, I'll carry on. It'll come back to me. Tons of, um, as Julian saw, tons of frogs in the night. <laughs> it's these little things that are kind of weird, but they look, they're on the track everywhere, and they look at you with their little eyes right into your headlamp. And later on, I know this is really bad, but I just sometimes got the urge just to like stab them with my poles. <laughs> but I never did, but I thought I was going to stand on them and stuff because they were just everywhere, everywhere. Um, after that too there was a lot of poos and I thought it was bear poo so I was kind of yelling out you know you were told to make a noise if you come across any bears in the night so I'd be yelling out like stupid things like um, come on bears you don't want like a little skinny kiwi when you can have a big fat American to <laughs> chomp on you know I'm completely wasted and I was just yelling these things out every time I saw bear, bear poo later on someone said to me it was elk poo so <laughs> disappointing but Anyway, <laughs> um, the next aid station's quite funny. I, as I was going to it, I can't even remember it actually. That aid station's just a completely, can't remember it. But just prior to getting to that aid station, just after here, a guy ran past me and um, took that photo. That was just, it looked really nice in the morning. My photography wasn't that good, to be honest, on the course. That was a good photo, so you can see the markings and stuff. So it was all beautiful scenery, the whole thing. Um, but we sort of got down into the forest, well I got in the forest and then this guy yelled at me from the bushes and said I'm lost, you know, which way to go. And I was on a pretty obvious trail and bearing in mind so 20 minute nap, been going for like 24 hours or a bit more than that. And this guy was called Ray Sanchez who I'd met at North Burn, he'd done that a few years ago. He'd run bad water, I think, so he's a pretty good, pretty good runner. He was lost in the bush, so I sort of joined him lost in the bush. And um, we wandered around for a while. He was more la-la than I was. 
and um, then he tried to t said well you have to go back this way and I said okay, I don't know because we both looked at the track where I just come off and we couldn't remember whether we'd come from down it or up it <laughs> you know when you, you go but anyway eventually I remember that I had my phone with me with the track on it which was great on the view ranger app and uh, so I found our way back but he was certainly gonna definitely go the wrong way um, Random, probably another hour to the next day the station. My husband left a nice little I love you sign on the track, which is sweet, very really sweet. But yeah, I don't remember that aid station at all, which is um, quite funny, quite funny. <laughs> um, so that was, so I guess that's two, um, yeah, that's the first day and then night. That's a nice lake view. That was kind of typical of the forest, big, those huge trees and stuff. That was um, before I had the nap, sorry, at the night, eating a toasted sandwich or something. I haven't got to this bit yet, anyway. That's one of my husband's signs they left for me. Um, so the next day, it was a, again nice weather, um, beautiful forest. Um, got to Spencer's Butt eventually and um, that was a hundred mile mark. I, I don't even know what time I got it, but I was really, I was quite tired then and a bit dehydrated and hot. Uh, so I just went through there quite quick. I was gonna see my husband at the next aid station. Um, probably a little mistake of the right. You know, I did let myself get dehydrated when I probably didn't need to. Um, but it was beautiful running, uh, very steep downhill though. So I was pretty glad I had poles, which really helped. Um, and then a lovely run along the track uh, along Lewis River, lots of waterfalls and things. They're probably, I should have my photos in better order. Go Jean, yep, that was another sign. Yeah, so that was, uh, it was really nice scenery there. Oh, I'll leave you that whole photo. <laughs> um, quite funny, because when you're, it was a lot of tourists there, walkers, like 50, 60, people wandering along the track and I just felt really smelly and manky and you're running along and they're all having their little you know, picnics and stuff. Um, so when I got to uh, that aid station I sort of I was a little bit tearful, burst into tears and said to my husband I need to sleep. So I actually went into the RV and had uh, a good hour's sleep which was great, it made a big difference. And I came out of there but I was, so I was at the aid station for nearly two hours all up, uh, which was a long time for me. As I was coming out, I saw Van, who was the second woman. I didn't even know who it was at the time, but I know now. <laughs> so she saw me. She didn't stop, actually, at that aid station. She tried to catch me up. But I think because I'd had that sleep, I was going quite a bit faster than her. Um, so I carried on. It was quite nice, bush and stuff. And, and then I met, um, caught up to Ray Sanchez again. <laughs> I was a bit scared of him because he got me lost in that bush for no good reason really earlier on and um, and he said how far you know to the before we go up the climb because they said on the notes that once you start the climb up to council bluff you won't there won't be any water and I didn't really know how far um, luckily I just happened to have enough water really there and I decided I'd just overtake him and keep going because I was a bit worried that he might lead me astray <laughs> he might be a liability for me poor guy so I took off and left him in the dust and um, it's quite an interesting climb it was in the dark and I was quite pleased uh, I was doing it in the dark because it was really uh, white dusty sort of almost like going up a luge track and we just went on for hours and hours and hours quite a steep up um, but I felt pretty good and there was a lot of frogs there like a lot of frogs like probably five or six frogs per square meter tons of them um, so this is my second night, so I got to Council Bluff, the next um, aid station. I was had planned to sleep there, I got there pretty much on, a bit er, two hours earlier than I was supposed to. Um, but it started to rain then, it actually got quite cold. Uh, so it's funny, it went from like really hot and warm to cold. Um, I, and 